Hi, and welcome to Lecture 2 for Psych 2317, Statistical Methods for Psychology. So the plan for today is to do two things. First, we're going to learn about standardized scores, uh, what these are and why we might use them. And then we're going to learn briefly, uh, we'll, we'll discuss how one could convert between raw scores that you might see using some measurement instrument and these new standardized scores. We won't do a lot of problems, but we'll talk about this more on the conceptual uh, point of view. So let's go ahead and get started. Now sometimes in our work, it's going to be very useful to be able to compare a single measurement that we might take to other measurements, maybe measurements that we've also taken for other participants or other groups of participants, or as we'll see in the example today, uh, other measurements that were used to define what is expected on a given test or a given scale. So for example, uh, just to, to start us off today, let's consider two applicants that we might have for a scholarship. Applicant one, we know that they scored a 1270 on the SAT. Now, if you're watching this and you're not in the United States, the SAT is a common uh, standardized exam for university entrance. Now we have another applicant, applicant two, and they scored a 30 on the ACT, the ACT being a different college admittance exam. Now the natural question here is which applicant scored the best? Okay, seems like an easy question on its face, but of course there is a big problem here. Because these two scores are on different underlying scales, we cannot directly compare these two scores. They are simply not comparable with the measurement scales that were given, the fact that they're different. So of course this problem is exactly what the solution of standardized scores is developed for. We need a way to get them on the same scale. And to do that, we're going to talk about standardized scores. So how would this work? How would we go through a process of standardization and get to be able to compare these two applicants on, a, on, on the same scale? Well, first of all, we need some background knowledge about the tests. Now, we know what each person scored. We know that applicant one scored a 1270 on the SAT. And we might ask, well, how does that compare to the average person? Or how does that compare to the distribution of people who would have taken the SAT? And we can ask the same thing for the ACT. So we need to know something in, in background about the scores that we expect on the SAT and the ACT. And it turns out that we can find out the answer to those questions by simply looking it up. So I did this before I wrote this lecture, and as of the time of recording of this video, the SAT has a mean of approximately 1060, or 1060 as we would usually call it, with a standard deviation of 210. Now remember from lecture one, this means that on average we expect a score of 1060, and the average difference from that mean, roughly speaking, is about 210 points. So on average, we can expect people to deviate 210 points from that center score of 1060. The same thing can be said for the ACT. Turns out that the mean ACT score is 21 with a standard deviation of about six. Now, again, if you go and look these up, depending on when you do it, you might find slightly different numbers because they renorm these tests uh, periodically. And plus, I'm using whole numbers to, uh, to ease the exposition here. But the point remains. So the SAT, people score on average a 1060 with a standard deviation of 210. And the ACT, people score an average of 21 with a standard deviation of 6. Now immediately, we can see that both of our applicants scored above the mean. Remember applicant one scored a 1270 on the SAT, that's certainly above the mean of 1060. And applicant two scored a 30 on the ACT, that's above the mean of 21. But the question that we haven't answered yet is, yes, they're both above the mean, but how far above the mean? Where exactly? in that distribution of scores 
are each of these applicants located? Now with a little bit of thought and not too much formal mathematics, we can actually solve that problem pretty nicely. What we're going to do, and this is the key uh, trick, if you will, or the, the key clever breakthrough for this unit, and that is we're going to use the standard deviation as a unit of measurement. So what does that mean? Well, you'll see in a second. What we mean is we're going to talk about where a person's score is compared to the mean, but in terms of the number of standard deviations that this person is away from the mean. Let's see exactly what we mean by this. Consider applicant one. They scored a 1270 on the SAT. Now the mean is 1060. So that means the applicant one scored 210 points above the mean. And what we just showed a second ago was that the standard deviation for the SAT is 210. So this applicant scored exactly one standard deviation above the mean. Okay, if we use the standard deviation as you know, a measurement tool or a yardstick, this is not a yardstick, but you get the point, then we can use that to say this person scored one standard deviation above the mean. Okay. Now by itself that might not be very useful, but consider also looking simultaneously at applicant two. Applicant two, we know they scored a 30 on the ACT. Now the mean was 21, so that means that applicant two scored nine points above the mean. Now the standard deviation for the ACT is six points. So if this person scored nine points above the mean, nine points is one and a half of those standard deviations. And so what that means is applicant two scored 1.5 standard deviations above the mean. Now why is this useful? Well now we can do a comparison and we can see immediately that applicant two has the higher standardized score. Why is that? Well, the reason is because applicant two, in terms of standard deviations, they scored one and a half standard deviations above the mean, whereas applicant one only scored one standard deviation above the mean. And so even though applicants one and two are on completely different measurement scales, we are able to directly compare them if we can somehow transform those raw scores, the raw SAT score and the raw ACT score, onto something that's the same and thus can be compared. And that's exactly what we get with standardized scores. So formally, this process of standardizing that we just walked through, any example that we would do would be similar, okay? This process actually has a name, and this is actually the name we're going to use repeatedly this semester, and it's called the Z-score, okay? This Z-score has a formula, okay? So first, I'll give you, I'll, I'll do this often this semester. First, I'll give you the formula in words. How would one go and compute a Z-score? Well, the way it's done is as follows. Essentially, you take the difference, let me get my highlighter here, you take the difference in the raw score and the mean, okay, and you divide it by the standard deviation. Okay? Now, if you wanna see where that comes from, just go back a couple of minutes in the video and look at how we figured out these Z-scores up here. We figured out what the difference was that's what the 2, 10, and the 9 are. And then we divided that difference by the standard deviation. And that's how we got one standard deviation above the mean and 1.5 up here. So computing a z-score amounts to taking the raw score, subtracting the mean, and then dividing by standard deviation. Now, one of the things that we often will do in mathematics is you get tired of writing after a while. And so if we can say the same thing using fewer symbols, that's probably a good thing. And so more commonly, you will see a formula that looks like this. Z equals X minus, oh my goodness, some new symbols that we haven't looked at yet. These new symbols are nothing to be scared of. These are simply Greek letters. This one is the Greek letter mu. And mu, because it's a Greek letter, it's essentially the Greek equivalent of our letter M, mu typically represents the mean. 
And this guy down here, this is a sigma, okay? It's like a little O with a tail on it. The sigma is a Greek letter equivalent of our letter S, and that's what represents standard deviation. So more often than not this semester, you will see the formula written like this. But remember, it means nothing more than this in words. And I'll just put a little point in your notes here. These Greek letters are usually what we're going to represent the mean and standard deviation with throughout the semester. Now, this is a, a pretty short unit. What I want to do is talk through the types of problems that you will solve when you do homework and, and, and some extra practice in this unit. There's three main types. The first type of problem is one where we're going to convert raw scores to z-scores. So we're actually going to do the standardization. Now it turns out you've already done this. In fact, you've already done it twice. You did it with the ACT score and the, and the SAT score above. That's what we mean when we say convert the raw scores on that scale to these z-scores. Now another way that we can, another type of problem that we can do is the reverse. We can instead convert z-scores back to raw scores. So for example, what if I told you that this person scored a z-score of 2 on the ACT? Well, if you think about it, a z-score of 2 means that you're two standard deviations above the mean. So if you know the mean, which was 21, and you know the standard deviation, which is 6, then all you've got to do is add two of those standard deviations to the mean. So 21 plus 6 plus 6, which will give you a total of 33. So that would give you the raw score associated with the z-score. Now, if that was a little too wordy for you, check this out. Just go back up to the formula. If you were going to, I'm going to erase this from the notes uh, at the end, but if I, if I were just going to do a problem like this, and I told you you had a z-score of 2, you wanted to know what the raw score was. Well, that's just an unknown, right? We know what the mean is. Oops, didn't mean to do that. And we know what the standard deviation is. That's just a little algebraic equation that we can solve. Okay. So it turns out that these kinds of problems are not hard to solve at all. So let me get rid of this stuff just to clean up my notes. And you can practice some of those on your homework. So we'll convert raw scores to z-scores, we'll convert z-scores back to raw scores, and then finally, the last type of problem that we might want to be able to solve in our homeworks this, in this unit are to be able to convert raw scores on one measurement scale to another. Now these require a little bit more work, but the trick is really simple. The trick is if you've got a raw score on one scale, and you've got a raw score on the other scale, how do you go from one to the other? The trick is you use the z-score as an intermediary. So for example, if you know you've got a raw score of say 25, just picking one here, on the ACT, convert that to a z-score. It turns out a raw score of 25 is uh, four divided by six, it's two thirds, or 0.67. That's a z-score that you can then convert to a new raw score, say, on the SAT scale. And, and what this would do is essentially use the types of problems here to combine and solve this type of problem. So that's all, that's all there is. So really and truly, if you understand that a z-score is nothing more than the number of standard deviations that you are from the mean, then you know everything you need to know about z-scores. And everything from there is just an application of that principle. So I want to end the lecture by writing that summary point. When we're talking about standardized or z-scores, remember that a z-score is simply the number of standard deviations from the mean. And let's highlight that and burn it into your memory. That is the one sentence summary of everything that we did today. And that's it. So, practice your homework. If you have any questions, let me know. 
and we're going to use these z-scores uh, to some really good effect in the next lecture when we begin talking about probability theory and the normal distribution and how to quantify uncertainty. All right, so I'll see you in the next lecture. Take care.